Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the shifting plans to get half a million AstraZeneca vaccine doses off the shelf. It's just the mixed messages. Please give us one set of guidelines. Canada's top doctors spend the day debating whether to recommend the shots for seniors while provinces figure out how to use it all. Also tonight, a rising tide of cases in Ontario. Some experts worry could turn into a third wave. Today on my shift, I've seen more cases than I've seen in the last month. And alarming new information about the deadliness of one of the variants. Plus, we go inside a vaccine clinic, find out what it's like to get the shot, and hear some post-pandemic party plans. At least I can go up and hug my grandkids now. <laughs> Hugs are at the top of the to-do list. This is The National. For months, the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine has felt agonizingly slow. But now, on the eve of the one-year anniversary of the pandemic, the ramp-up seems to finally be underway. Yeah, millions of doses are expected to come into Canada in the next few weeks, bringing hope, but also continued debate over who should get which vaccine. Today, members of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization met once again to discuss the AstraZeneca vaccine. The question, whether to reverse its position and recommend it for those over 65. But as Alison Northcott tells us, with half a million doses set to expire in just a few weeks, the provinces aren't waiting to get it off the shelf. I have my appointment for March the 30th. Ruth Peltier doesn't know which vaccine she'll be offered later this month, but the 76-year-old says she's confused and worried about the newest one to arrive in Canada, AstraZeneca. It's just the mixed messages. Please give us one set of guidelines not a different one depending on what region you live in. You know, give it to us, give it to us straight. While Health Canada approved AstraZeneca for all adults, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is not recommending it for those over 65 because of limited information on its efficacy in that age group. But now there is real-world data, including from the UK, and the head of the committee tells CBC News it met today to review it and an update is coming. Hi, are you together? Quebec has already said it will give AstraZeneca to people over 65, following advice from its own vaccine advisors. In recent days, there were uh, several studies from England and Scotland showing a great performance of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the elderly. With the first doses now here, half a million of them, provinces have to decide quickly how to use them before some expire next month. In Alberta, people 50 to 64 could start booking their appointments today, and thousands did. Manitoba announced today people aged 50 to 64 and First Nations people aged 30 to 64 can get the shot, starting with those with high-risk medical conditions. In Ontario, a pilot project where people 60 to 64 can get the vaccine in pharmacies, and on PEI, people as young as 18 who work in the food service industry will be eligible. People, you really have to convey that position of trust. You Dr. Zane Chagla says while the changing evidence and guidance may be confusing. I would 100% pick being partially or, or even almost fully protected as compared to waiting for optimal protection in that sense. He says any approved vaccine will help. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, so let's bring in infectious diseases specialist and member of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution task force here in Ontario, Dr. Isaac Bogosh. So, Dr. Bogosh, we know NASI met today. We know an update of some sort is coming, which, which sort of makes me think a few steps ahead to what would happen if it did change its mind. I mean, how would that affect all of the provincial rollout plans, do you think? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think the provinces would have to rapidly accommodate to any changes in NACI. Many of the provinces are adhering to the NACI guidance, of, so, although we have seen Quebec say that they are going to give this vaccine to those over the age of 65. But for the rest of the provinces, it would mean pivoting to keep up with any changes in the NACI recommendations. And, and But does it mean that? Because, I mean, you're on the Ontario Distribution Task Force, right? W would your recommendation be to shift gears and get this vaccine into older people if that becomes the recommendation? Or does it make more sense to vaccinate younger people to try to stop, prevent those chains of transmission, prevent spread? I think from a public health standpoint and in the midst of a public health crisis, the first option would be to stop sick individuals from dying and currently all the vaccines that we have approved in Canada are very good at that including the AstraZeneca vaccine 
And if NACI changed their guidance, I think the provinces would all align with that and really provide this vaccine to older populations. We know they account for over 90 percent of all the deaths mm -hmm. in the country. So I think that's how the provinces would adjust. We will continue to wait and see what happens. Dr. Bogosh, thank you. My pleasure. Now, as of today, more than two million Canadians have received at least one dose of a vaccine. They're the best defense against a possible third wave. And in Canada's biggest province, there is real concern that wave is building. Ontario reported more than 1,300 new cases today. But take a look at the overall trend line. You can see that rolling seven-day average has been pretty flat since the middle of last month. But in recent days, it's this little bend in the curve upwards that has some worrying. Is it just a ripple or the beginning of something much bigger? Here's Ellen Morrow. In Toronto, crews preparing for the worst, a field hospital under construction as the specter of a third wave grows. We always want to be ready. You know, as things begin to escalate, we can certainly escalate. You know, we can. That escalation already being felt, says this ER doctor. Today on my shift, I've seen more cases than I've seen in the last month. Ontario's case count, once declining, is again on the rise while restrictions are being lifted. About 30% of those new cases are variants of concern, more contagious, and the one first discovered in the UK, far more deadly, according to new research. A lot of things that you did before that were safe aren't safe as much now. We have to assume that it's everywhere and out there now. People need to be careful. That's what Sadia Beg has been doing for a year. On dialysis, she's at a much higher risk of a bad outcome with COVID. More so than anything, I know my anxiety levels have risen quite a bit. Um, I have had a panic, panic attack having to go to the hospital myself four times a week for dialysis. ICUs across Ontario have remained under stress. More than 300 patients are receiving critical care. Well, you go into an intensive care unit, anywhere in Ontario, but especially in our hotspots, and it is a war zone still. One hotspot, Thunder Bay in northern Ontario. We are in the worst situation we have ever experienced here so far in this pandemic. That puts pressure on the province's already criticized vaccine rollout. The best hope that any third wave will be less deadly. Warmer weather helps too. Everyone um, hold tight and really accelerate the vaccine rollout. Get all of the doses into people's arms and then we'll get through this and summer, summer will be a great time. Ready, one, two, it can't three, come soon enough for this <laughs> Toronto area mom. Her son has autism. The past year robbed of routine has been tough. I'm hoping that we don't go into a third wave. I don't know how I would be able to handle it. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the federal government vowed again today to end boil water advisories in First Nations communities. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller held a press conference, but as Olivia Stefanovich tells us, for many, what was actually announced wasn't good enough. When COVID-19 tore through Shamatawa First Nation, people in the northern Manitoba community were told to wash their hands regularly, except there was one problem. They don't have clean water flowing from their taps. We deserve better as Canadian citizens. The chief says he's fought with the federal government to fix the problem for years. The response, less than satisfactory. One of the bureaucrats literally told me in a meeting with my council and other bureaucrats at the table saying, literally said, I need to cry for the money. During the 2015 federal election campaign, Justin Trudeau pledged to lift all long-term drinking water advisories on reserves within five years of forming government. Because it's not right in a country like Canada. Six years later, 101 have been lifted. More than 50 still remain. Today, an update came in the form of a new website to track progress and a renewal of the pledge to clear all remaining advisories. You may say that a website alone doesn't do that, but it does start to build the confidence because people get to see what I'm seeing, what my department's seeing. They also get to see uh, perhaps uh, some of the challenges and pitfalls. The best they're going to give us is a website. Um, I, I, they're conning Canadians. The opposition says the government needs to deal with the underlying structural problems. There is no timeline because they're not going to get this done and I think they know it. So in Shimadawa, the wait continues. We're talking about turning on a tap 
and being able to give your child water from the tap. Is that so much to ask for? The government committed more than three and a half billion dollars to get clean water flowing in First Nations. There was no new money in today's announcement. The government says it's learned from past failures, but it still doesn't know how long it will take to finally get the job done. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. A Manitoba man who stormed the gates of Rideau Hall last July, armed with several weapons, has been sentenced to six years in prison. Corey Hearn, a military reservist, had several guns and multiple rounds of ammunition when he drove onto the grounds with a plan to arrest the Prime Minister for his pandemic policies and for banning assault-style firearms. The 46-year-old was given one year of credit for time served, meaning he still faces five years behind bars. The Prime Minister faced tough questions today in question period over his handling of sexual misconduct allegations concerning the former Chief of the Defence Staff, Jonathan Vance. At issue, what he knew and when. Is it the Prime Minister's position that no one made him aware of the allegations of misconduct against General Vance three years ago? My office was aware of the Minister's direction to the Ombudsman to follow up with appropriate authorities. But my office and I learned the details of the allegations over the past months only. Now, in 2015, in one of his first initiatives as the country's top soldier, General Vance launched Operation Honor. It was the military's effort to prevent and address sexual misconduct within its ranks. But a new investigation by the CBC's Fifth Estate is raising questions about the military's ability to investigate and prosecute its own. Tom Murphy explains. Choose my words carefully here. In his 13 years in the Canadian Armed Forces, former military police officer Jesse Zillman says he saw a lot. I was getting very frustrated with the military system. Frustrated in part because of the interference he says he witnessed in sexual assault prosecutions in the military legal system from people higher up the chain of command. We'd have units that would reach out and ask for the victim's contact information, which is huge. No, you know you cannot have that. Um, but it, it seemed to keep continue happening. Zillman's comments come as retired General Jonathan Vance, the architect of Operation Honor, a Canadian Forces program designed to stamp out sexual assault in the Canadian military. It must stop now. Is himself under military police and parliamentary investigation for inappropriate sexual conduct against female subordinates. Sir, I have the watch. And his successor, Art McDonald, on the job for just over a month, is also under investigation for sexual misconduct. This leading military lawyer, who recently testified before a House of Commons committee, questions the military's ability to even charge commanders. Because somebody acting as a commanding officer you would have to authorize the charge, and there's nobody who acts as commanding officer of a chief of the defense staff. This former federal justice has long called for all sex offenses in the military to be heard in the civilian court system instead. It will have to be a political change within Parliament because I don't think they, they, they're willing to, to change the system as it is. The military police force is continuing to investigate the two former chiefs of defence staff. There's still no word on any possible charges and if there are, whether they'll be heard in the military justice system. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. You can see Tom's full report, Broken Honor, tomorrow night on the Fifth Estate. Should sexual assault investigations be taken out of the hands of the military? That's at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and CBC Gem. Alberta's Justice Minister gave a warning to the Lethbridge Police Force today after a CBC News investigation into the actions of some of its members. Five officers are accused of surveilling a former provincial cabinet minister without cause. And as Aaron Collins tells us, it could be their jobs now on the line. It has all the markings of a box office thriller. Police alleged to have spied on a local politician. But at its heart, it's a story about trust. Any time that uh, trust is violated by any employee is a serious matter. Lethbridge's police chief reacting today, days after CBC News broke the story. 
five of his officers accused of breaking that trust, surveilling their local MLA Shannon Phillips, then the provincial environment minister at this cafe, secretly snapping pictures of a meeting with environmentalists and posting them online, later searching her name in the police database without cause. Those actions now under investigation by the province's police watchdog. Lethbridge's top cop says he'll take action if his officers are found in the wrong. The corrective actions for our officers' wrongdoing range from uh, simple warning to uh, discharge. The reason for the alleged surveillance? Opposition to propose changes to a local wilderness area. Actions the province's justice minister says have no place in policing. The law enforcement that wields an extraordinary amount of power abuse that power in the course of their work. A sentiment that crosses even Alberta's gaping political divide. If you cannot find it in you to prosecute those duties in a way that leaves aside your uh, feelings uh, and your little political tantrums, if you cannot do that, you do not deserve the gun and the badge and the uniform. Alberta's justice minister says he wants Lethbridge police to settle the matter quickly. If they don't, he says he'll step in. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. COVID-19 has left provinces desperate for cash, but a CBC News investigation reveals hundreds of millions of dollars they could be collecting in unpaid fines, including from a massive environmental disaster that has effectively gone unpunished. Aaron Saltzman walks us through it. <laughs> The explosions at Sunrise Propane were so powerful, the smoke so thick, authorities declared the area a no-fly zone. Thousands were forced from their homes. Two people died. Vikram Saini lost his 23-year-old brother, Parminder. It's hard for my father and mother. The owners of the company were found guilty of nine provincial offenses and fined more than $5 million. Nearly 13 years later, not one cent has been paid. In fact, CBC News found more than $1.3 billion in unpaid fines across the country, some dating back decades. The largest, a $13 million fine in Quebec from 2019 for securities fraud. Someone in Newfoundland and Labrador owes nearly $72,000 for driving offenses from 1994. In Regina, a driver racked up 70 grand in parking tickets and never paid. Many large fines in default involve environmental offenses. It's extremely troubling. Um, if people know that fines are not being collected, then they're simply not going to treat these kind of uh, offenses very seriously. In some parts of the country, provincial fines are collected by municipalities. Toronto has more than half a billion on its books, 100 million of that more than 20 years old. Collection agencies particularly wouldn't have had perhaps the information they have today to find individuals as we're more digital as a community. So the tools have improved. And she says collection rates have improved as well. But that's little comfort to Vikram Saini. It's hard to talk about, isn't it? Well, yeah, sometimes I like that. Take a minute. All these years later, only the victims have paid the price. So, Aaron, what, if anything, is being done to recover all that money owed to the provinces and cities? So, in Ontario, Adrian, the province has downloaded the collection of provincial fines onto cities. So, with Sunrise, Toronto is responsible for collecting those fines. Now, it has sent those to a collection agency, but it also has the option of civil enforcement, which is essentially taking the people involved to court, but it hasn't done that. And so what are officials saying about it? Well, Toronto told us that more than 97% of the fines in that city are paid on time. They've actually set up a special collections agency to collect fines only that are 20 years old or more. And they say their collections are improving, just with some notable exceptions. Yeah, no kidding. All right, Aaron, thank you for this. You bet. Well, the U.N. Security Council is condemning more violence by Myanmar's military against protesters today. 
soldiers opened fire outside a compound of striking rail workers opposing the junta. Several people were hurt. At least 60 people have been killed in violence since last month's coup, and at least 2,000 people were arrested. Rene Filipponi introduce, introduces us to those caught in the chaos. This scene is playing out daily now in cities across Myanmar. Protesters on the run from police and clouds of tear gas. We are treating the burn injuries from the stun grenade, says this first aid attendant. Set up in the middle of it all, this team of medics treat nearly 60 people a day, putting their own safety on the line to do it. Others like them have been beaten by police. We inform the authorities what we are doing and let the neighbors know we are here, says Ang Miao Yu. He says they are remaining neutral and will treat both protesters and police. The military is tightening its grip on power. Last night, an opposition politician was dragged from his home by police. Journalists tell us they fear the same. A lot of journalists I know have not been sleeping in their homes. Thin Lai Win founded new site Myanmar Now, but currently lives abroad. She says her former office was raided by police this week. I think we can surmise that this is an attempt to try and stop the flow of information getting out of Myanmar onto the world stage so that people will know what is going on. And despite international calls to end the coup, military leaders continue to push for a violent crackdown. But it appears dissent is growing among the rank and file. About 100 people have fled to this border town in India to seek refuge, mostly police officers and their families. The duty of the police is to protect the people, says this officer. He was ordered to open fire on protesters and refused. He fled, leaving behind his wife and two children and scenes like these. In a town in northern Myanmar, a nun fell to her knees begging police to stop the violence after a man was shot dead in front of her. I don't want to see any trouble, says Sister Rose Nutong, who told them to shoot her and not the children. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Meghan Markle has filed an official complaint against former British TV host Pierce Morgan over his comments about her interview with Oprah. I'm angry to the point of bawling over today. I'm sickened by what I've just had to watch. I, I'm sorry, I don't believe a word she says, Meghan Markle. Well, that's a I wouldn't believe it if she read me a weather report. Reports suggest the complaint addresses the impact his comments could have on others dealing with mental health issues. Pierce Morgan left Good Morning Britain on Tuesday, has since said he stands by his criticism of Harry and Meghan. Well, many Canadian musicians tell us they are feeling the pandemic pinch. Coming up, music revenues are drying up and streaming isn't paying the bills. The cost of making music. We deserve a minimum wage. For others, the pandemic pivot. I've been wanting to change careers. I'm ready. This is the time to do it. Stories from people who've done a 180 in the last 12 months. And as vaccinations ramp up, so do dreams of post-pandemic life. Go to Las Vegas, play Mahjong. <laughs> we will join you in Vegas. <laughs> First, we're back in two. Welcome back. A year after the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic, new data from StatsCan today affirmed what so many have experienced firsthand, that COVID-19 in Canada has been deadliest in racially diverse communities. Areas where a quarter of the population or more identified as visible minorities, meaning non-white and non-Indigenous people because they're counted separately, COVID-19 mortality rates were twice as high as they were in communities with the fewest visible minorities. The differences were especially high in Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. And those numbers, of course, are reflective of bigger issues like access to health care. Christine Birak looks at why some high-risk communities aren't always getting the help they need. Paulina Agadou is on a mission that seems impossible. A single infection can spread like wildfire through crowded housing. Her job is to hand deliver trusted information. You want this one? Yeah, it's for, it's for COVID-19. Okay. If you want to have a test done. 
Agadu reaches out to people in a neighborhood hit hard by this virus. She meets personal support workers, Uber drivers and clerks struggling to make ends meet. A lot of people need help. Hi, Judith. Yeah, go ahead. Agadu's a volunteer with the Black Creek Community Health Center. While many have never heard of community health centers or CHCs, they've stepped up to help slow the spread of this virus, often in areas that had high case rates but few resources. Cheryl Prescott runs the Black Creek Center. Our services are a bit underestimated. We, we feel invisible that, you know, compared to larger hospitals or larger healthcare institutions. Can I get two? Unlike hospitals, they feed and connect with people on the margins. CHCs exist in every province, offering one-stop medical and social services. And they've been pushing for accessible testing and soon vaccinations as well. Throughout this past year, I believe that we saw our value. Still, provincial funding for community health centers isn't stable, and doctors say the problems are clear. There's actually systemic discrimination in the way we pay uh, for primary care. If you put the map of where primary care funding was and the map of where COVID was, there's a complete mismatch. Experts insist community health centers need funding like never before. At an average minimum wage, Full-time workers in Canada are now making less than $25,000 a year before taxes, and most have no sick days. Reports show the pandemic is only widening the income gap. Who lives and who dies? And, and this is how stark the pandemic has been in exposing our public policy failures. She was crying. I said, why are you crying? Agadu says she was able to help a woman who was about to lose her job unless she had a COVID test. She knows if the virus is anywhere, it's everywhere. She's not paid to do it, and yet she sees it as her job to try to protect everyone. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Tomorrow marks one year since the WHO declared a global pandemic, and so much in our lives has changed, for some, permanently changed how to, to build up what was a side business to my primary source of income. Coming up, the pandemic pivot, a now familiar term for many Canadians. Plus, I think it's going to be really emotional when I get my needle. Yeah, the raw emotions of a turning point in the COVID story. Stay with us. One year into the pandemic, and there's no denying everyone has had to adapt. Take, for example, this University of British Columbia student studying remotely from India. My day usually starts at 1 a.m. Like, my classes start at 1 a.m. And um, it goes on till about 5.30 a.m. So some people are adapting to time zones. Others are adapting to new technology, like this grandmother, who learned how to keep in touch with her grandkids virtually. It's been a great year. I mean, I don't know where to begin. I've learned so much. I honestly, I feel like a kid on the first day of the school. And every time I learn more, I realize I have a ways to go. Okay, so well done to them. There are also those who have had to make some very big adjustments, like career changes. David Common looks at how the pandemic has thrown some people off their career paths and how they've landed on their feet. Do you know what really pairs well with Chardonnay from Chablis is oysters. So Ryan Sullivan is a man reinvented. Let's go ahead and do our classic swirl. Passionate uh, about wine, and now and making his living as a sommelier and sharing tips with clients online. But a year ago, Ryan was an airline captain with Porter in Toronto until the pandemic grounded the entire fleet. But when we shut down, I mean, confusion, concern, um, uh, without a doubt, like we didn't know what was happening. And it's As the weeks passed, the bills oil, piled up, savings whittled land. down. This one has a bit more of a gold color to it. And so Ryan wondered, could he turn a wine hobby so into a full-time business? It took a few months of soul searching and I was asking a lot of my friends and my colleagues, what do you think of this? What do you think? You know, I was asking a lot because I'm trying to learn as much myself on how to to build up what was a side business to my primary source of income uh, now into 2021. Is it paying the bills? It's paying the bills, food's on the table, uh, mortgages being paid. 
It's been a slog though. Even for an enterprising entrepreneur, he may not be back to flying for a while. One of the few areas harder hit than aviation are restaurants. Uh, we're gonna be growing squash and cucumbers, kale. This time last year, Liz Guerrier was in her 10th year running her own pub. The pandemic changed everything. How hard was the decision to shut it down? It was extremely difficult. Possibly, possibly one of the hardest choices of my life. It meant saying goodbye to the business that I'd struggled and for many years worked so hard to build. And yeah, so very hard to leave that behind. Leaving not just the pub, but the city. So over here is where we planted the garlic. Moving an hour away here to the wide open spaces of air in Ontario with her partner with big plans to not serve food, but grow it. We're going to be growing uh, fresh vegetables and some fruit and cut flowers and herbs. And uh, we hope to offer some farm stays as well. So people who sign up for shares, they purchase a share and then uh, they get a delivery of fresh vegetables throughout the season. There's going to be a high tunnel greenhouse down here. Yeah, let's head off into it. She's had farmers offer tips and taken courses online. The move may look bold to some, but Liz didn't see a lot of other options. Honestly, not a lot of other choices. You know, when sad fact is, 52 years old, not a lot of people going to hire me for much of anything, especially under these conditions where the, my industry, former industry, has just been decimated. Megan Hain knows all about that. Her relative peace today replaces her near panic at the pandemic start when she was working as a server at two places in Toronto. So obviously both of my restaurants shut. I was downtown Toronto, but uh, luckily I have a really incredible partner who was like, oh, just come stay with me. So it was pretty stressful at the beginning. Megan relied on Serb to get by, but also saw opportunity in the shutdown. So, you know, I was starting to just look into other options of like what I could actually do. Um, my brother actually um, owns a software developing company and he's in Toronto and so when the pandemic hit, his work just went straight online and he just didn't miss a beat. Megan didn't either. Picking up a scholarship at Lighthouse Labs, a private rapid tech boot camp, now retraining hundreds. What we're going to want you to do is figure out how to take some of that code. Lighthouse Labs founder Jeremy Shackey has also moved the retraining completely online. We've really seen that growth go quite tremendously. Um, so we have about a little bit more than double uh, the enrollments. If not, we're closing in on triple the size of what we're seeing. Take a look at looping techniques. I think There's just important. people coming from these industries that have kind of fallen apart, the service industry. Huge amount of people coming who were working as waiters, waitresses, bartenders, whatever, all walking in and going, okay, I I've been wanting to change careers. I'm ready. This is the time to do it. Programming tools. Most don't have times for longer programs. They need a salary and quick. Nobody wants to take a huge amount of time. When you're 25, 30, 35, 40, there's too much life going on for you to take four years or two years to change it. For Megan, that was definitely the case. I probably wouldn't have been able to do a longer program at the time. You know, I obviously didn't have any financial support at the time and Taking out a big loan, it just it didn't interest me in any way. Reinventing yourself is a big task, but all three consider themselves lucky. They've been able to do it and recognize many have not. Everyone now hoping for a return to some greater certainty. David Palman, CBC News, Aaron, Ontario. So lots of lives have been changed yeah. by the pandemic, not always for the worse, but many for the unexpected. So we're going to bring you some stories of people who faced challenges over the past year and came out thriving. Yeah, that's our series called How It Started, How It's Going. As we head to break, meet a Toronto couple who found a new home in a totally different province. My partner Dog and I were working from home and living in a one bedroom, one bath condo in downtown Toronto. I turned the kitchen living room space into my movement studio. My partner was taking calls from our bedroom. 
we're now working from home in a 100 year old parsonage in rural Nova Scotia. We're pretty close to the ocean, which has been so nice to take the dog out for walks there. So the move itself was a challenge. Purchasing a home sight unseen, just with speaking to the realtor, seeing the listing is a little out there. The pandemic forced me to question some of the decisions I was making mindlessly, to be more mindful and to think creatively about the life that I want to live. <laughs> oh gosh, remember hugs? Well, this one was a whole year in the making. After getting her second vaccine shot, New Yorker Evelyn Shaw's doctor wrote her a prescription to go hug her granddaughter. And safe to say, well, she filled that prescription immediately. Now, those scenes could be coming to a home near you. As of today, two million Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine. Nick Purden went to meet some of the newly vaccinated to share some of their joy and their relief as they dare to look forward. You don't need me to tell you that the people who suffered the most in the last year are our seniors. That's why they're among the first in line to get the vaccine. I've come to this vaccination clinic to find out what the shot means to them. Right now, I'm kind of elated, really. Elated. Okay, don't get frisky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. I'm glad I got it. And I hope to uh, survive this terrible pandemic. And survival is a theme here. I've worried a lot about uh, not making it. George Sweetman is a retired firefighter. He's 82. I had a lowered immune system, so I was always cautious about uh, catching it. For George, the vaccine is how he's going to get his life back. It gives me a great sense of relief. At least I can go up and hug my grandkids now. And I got a new uh, great-grandchild and hug that one too. Plans for the future. That's one of the things that everyone here talks about. Go back to be able to cr have cruises, go to Las Vegas, play mahjong, <laughs> get together with my friends and go out for dinner, for lobster. I'm looking forward to it if I'm still around. Spend time with the family and get together and have them supper together, which we haven't had in I can't remember when. I want to go away to my other son who lives in California. I told everyone when this is all over, we're having a big party for everyone. <laughs> but not everybody is thinking ahead to a big celebration. What does it mean for you to get your shot today? Freedom? Yeah. Freedom to go out. Go and have a coffee, go, go to a restaurant when things open up, get, get her life back. Catherine and Edna Miles have lived together through the entire pandemic. My mother and my aunt are really my only family. And so I haven't been able to, you know, see my aunt and thank goodness I'm with my mother, but they're all I have. With her aunt in long-term care, now that her mother's got the shot, Catherine's counting the hours until she can get her own. I think it's going to be really emotional when I get my needle that I'm going to be able to see my aunt again. And that's the thing here, people are pretty raw. I love her. I love her more than everywhere else. It's been very difficult as time goes on. Uh, not being able to see grandchildren, children, people. Um, they're very difficult. I'm very lucky. I feel very well, but I'll probably feel maybe 10 years younger when I can start going out again because I hate being alone. I hate being locked up like that. Unfortunately, I'm losing friends to, to the virus. That's Frida Hopkinson Manning. For her to be here today is bittersweet. Her best friend Irma is on her mind. She was a very dear friend and every day we would talk and pray with each other, every day. And she got the virus, she went in hospital, didn't spend very long and she died. I'm sad about that, that she didn't have a chance to get the vaccine. There's no one sentiment here. The vaccine signals an end to this terrible year, 
But that's not to say we will forget what we went through and who's not here. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Well put. Um, yes, there is sorrow, there is joy. Witnessing that joy fills me with joy, I have to say. And, and that must have been pretty special for you to see too because you, you know those halls at Humber River Hospital, right? I mean, and you know the people who who work there. Well, sure. I mean, we've been bringing you stories from Humber River yeah. uh, throughout the pandemic, mostly in the ICU, so that is special. And I have to say, uh, you know, if you've had the honor of watching someone you love get a shot, uh, as, as I did, it is mm. weirdly emotional. You think what about what everyone has been through, and to see that room full of kind, energetic people giving those shots, it's... It's, it's very touching. Yeah. I, I promise you, it's, it's very, very touching. <laughs> we all know millions still have to get the shot. And until then, we still live with restrictions on gatherings, including, of course, concerts. Remember those? The last couple of years have been nonstop shows. How up and coming musicians are now struggling to make a decent income. That's next. Well, the weekend is having a moment. Fresh off his Super Bowl halftime show, his latest hit, Blinding Lights, became the first by a Canadian to break two billion streams on Spotify, and it's among the six Junos for which he's been nominated. But for those musicians who aren't the weekend, or Jesse Reyes, or Justin Bieber, the music industry has been really tough during the pandemic. Eli Glasner shows us how some artists are supporting each other. This was the life of loud luxury. Raucous parties, DJing for thousands. Now the Juno winning duo is playing for these to stay connected with fans online. The lack of touring has taken a toll. In a huge way, because I mean, that, like I was saying, the last couple of years have been nonstop shows. I mean, we did our massive bus tour. I think it was like 90 shows or something like that. And if you won't cry. Rolling Stone called Montreal's Alison Russell one to watch. She also relied heavily on gigs to pay the bills. Then the pandemic wiped away three quarters of her income. And it really struck home when these walls came down was how precarious our existence was. You know, okay, it was like a month, we're fine. Two months, we're okay, we have enough. Three months, oh, how are we gonna pay rent? Part of the problem has been the shift from physical record sales to streaming services that simply don't pay enough. In order for me to earn an annual minimum wage of $30,000, I need to gain 6 million streams at the average royalty rate of half a cent per listen. That's unattainable. Then there's the question of where to play post-pandemic. According to the Canadian Independent Venue Coalition, over 90% of locations will not survive without government support. Fewer artists will get to play fewer shows for fewer people. So less creation of the kind of content that defines who we are as Canadians. While some say Ottawa needs to increase support, this composer is taking on Spotify, organizing a global action day to pressure Spotify to pay a penny for every stream. This argument is the initial version of like a minimum wage argument for musicians. And a way to ensure the next generation of voices will still be singing when the pandemic fades. By your side. Eli Glasper, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next on The National, taking pandemic connection offline. It's always nice to get mail that's not a bill or flyers or something. Yeah, remember real mail? Well, maybe check your mailbox. The moment is next. Well, these postcards are a handful of the free prepaid cards Canada Post is sending to every household in the country as a way to encourage Canadians to keep in touch with each other. They've started popping up in mailboxes, bringing a lot of joy to the people who are receiving and sending them. And tonight, the joy of regular old-fashioned mail is our moment. I really do think this is a wonderful idea. When I got that postcard, I was so happy about it. It gives people the chance to kind of rediscover the mail. Even a little postcard like that, just I think it can really brighten someone's day. I've sent one already to a friend that works in healthcare. 
I use different colored pens, so every sentence is a different color. I add stickers to it as well. <laughs> I literally use like every square inch of the postcards. It made me so happy. It just like made me so warm inside. It's always nice to get mail that's not a bill. So I sent it to two friends. It's just a little bit more special because it takes a little bit longer to, to do it. You know, you send your Christmas cards, holiday cards, or birthday card, but just having a just because card is really nice. <laughs> and what I love about this is all those people said they hovered around their neighbor's recycling bin, <laughs> looking to see if anyone had tossed them and then they would grab right. them and send them. Yeah, well, and, and, and I like how Chloe, uh, one of the speakers there, was thinking about it, how she thought of these as almost like souvenirs that you could keep, right? Souvenirs of a moment in time, right. which, you know, it's the longest long thinking moment, moment <laughs> that we've ever had, but there you go. That's The National for this March 10th. Have a great night. Good night.